Wow, those guys are really cool. Hello, and welcome back to the Bird Channel, where we talk about stories in movies, books, shows, and games, and I stream five days a week. Hi. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, editing Gen Z here? Or, you know, your sleep paralysis demon, whichever. Uh, I stream three days a week now, not five. I'd already recorded this, so, you know, this was inevitable. Whoops. <laughs> anyway, uh, carry on. <laughs> on twitch.tv slash Gen Z. Today's a long one, and they'll continue to be long. I've done a little poll for my patrons and Kofi cats, and the consensus was that I should just upload on a when it's done, it's done basis, and uh, long videos are the best. So here we are. This is on you. I love you very much. Enjoy my hour and then some long talk about Shadow Hearts from the New World. Most people I've heard talk about this game did not like it for one reason or another, and I can certainly see where they're coming from. I'll be honest, it didn't win any awards in my heart either. However, I also don't necessarily think this is a bad game, and it's important to talk about what it did well alongside its issues. Issues which I've no doubt were partially created due to the awkward development of the game. So let's talk about that. Spoilers ahead. Lots of them. Gather around the fire and let me tell you a tale. This video will absolutely be long enough without long character introductions, so I'm going to try and speed through those at record pace before I get to the story proper. But first, I have to explain how malice works. It's important, just trust me. If you've watched my previous videos on this topic already, and you really should because it gets complicated otherwise, then you know that from as far back as Kudelka, someone was always trying to get their hands on the Emigre document, the secret book that holds the secret to eternal life and resurrection and all that. So in every installment, someone is trying to resurrect someone else, but it always goes wrong. We get a little more exposition on the resurrection process this time, however, and one important fact is that to resurrect a person, they need an equal balance of malice and will. Malice, the crystallization of humanity's evil intent, is red, and will, the desire of the target to return to the world of the living, is blue. If there's malice but no will, then a body will form properly, but they won't have a soul, so it just looks like your loved one. If there's will but no malice, then there is no body, so the soul returns as just a soul, or sometimes a monster, like in Kudelka. Like in... like in Kudelka? Yes, New World messes with Kudelka. Honestly, not even just Kudelka. From my description, you'll have already noticed that something's not quite right. Apparently, in From the New World, the resurrection succeeded because there was a lot of malice to be used. Remember this bit from the second game? Behold! Aren't they beautiful? Perfect balls of negative energy. God Slayer, Pandora's box has been reopened. These unfettered bundles of malice will infect the world forever. That released a whole lot of malice into the world. During From the New World's experiments, the researchers also killed a few animals and even some humans. So that, combined with the malice released by the door, was enough to create the bodies. Not like the other rituals, Roger Bacon, yes, that one tells us. No, they relied purely on the deceased's will to return and nothing else. So you're telling me that in Kudelka it was purely will that returned Elaine. Elaine just couldn't wait to come back to this world. So she did, even without a body. But he only resurrected my physical body. As you can see, my soul is still doomed to roaming the universe. And also... Do not mourn my death. It was wrong for Patrick to try to resurrect me. To undo the work of God. Please, do not be sad. Death is at the heart of God's reasoning. Doesn't sound like she wants to come back, actually. Sounds like there's a body, though. Yeah, they made it backwards. You really can't argue that there wasn't enough malice used in Kudelka. They had a castle full of corpses. A castle full of corpses. 
There was so much malice, it made an angry ghost girl, among other things. And Shadow Hearts had that one guy who started sacrificing children en masse so he could resurrect his mother. The Covenant had a partially formed body of Alice, which I guess Roger created by sacrificing half the neighborhood? But Alice just didn't want to come back. Apparently. Anyway, that is how it works in From the New World. Malice becomes a plot device so powerful it makes things weirdly dull in terms of character progression. More on that later. About those characters. Our main protagonist is Johnny Garland, a 16-year-old boy who is determined not to live on his father's success and fortune, which is why he managed to rent a large Manhattan apartment at 16 while rescuing cats for a living in his self-made detective agency where he keeps Lenny from the last game as a manservant. But surprise, Johnny actually died at 16 in a car crash alongside his sister Grace. Thankfully, his father was approached by a definitely not shady man called Marlo, who knew of a way to resurrect the dead. You guessed it, they somehow found the emigre document again and attempted a resurrection, which mostly succeeded. Except Grace was the only one with the will to come back, whereas Johnny wasn't in the mood. So at the last moment, she gave Johnny her will to live, because apparently you can do that, which meant Johnny got to be a whole person and she herself was just a malice husk. And then she walked off to immediately murder their father, leaving Johnny alone, because Marlo fled the scene. Presumably, Roger Bacon, who was also present, took the newly alive Johnny away and threw him into a hospital, so we could all pretend that he was just in a fire and only he made it out alive. Everyone else is dead. Don't ask any questions, thank you. Oh no, Johnny has amnesia and is asking a lot of questions. That's his storyline, trying to regain his memory. Grace becomes one of our antagonists because she, as a creature of malice, is trying to make her way back to Malice Land, something she'll do by activating three malice beams that create a malice gate that leads to said malice land. She runs purely on instinct, drawn to malice. But also, if you're dying and she kisses you, you're now infused with malice and can summon malice demons and stuff. And she can kill you by doing a chop hand motion because malice? She does that a lot, just going off murdering people because the plot demands it. Are you wondering if malice becomes a bit of a fix-all this game? The answer is yes. Malice is shorthand for just magic, actually. John? Hmm? I'm trying to figure out how to get the plot going. Got any ideas? Uh, well, we can have this woman kill a bunch of people in various plot-significant locations. You're surprisingly looser today. Okay, how does she kill people? Magic. What? Malice. Malice. Malice? Yeah, malice. It, it, it's, it's evil. Evil malice? Malice is a descriptor of its own, thank you. But how does malice kill people? Is she just extremely violent no no see she does malice to people and then they die or resurrect or they summon monsters you know this sounds suspiciously like magic no it's malice it's an original concept and i came up with it okay ground rules of malice ground ground rules describe malice and its capabilities to me Okay, it's magic. Thank you. This could absolutely be a very interesting setup if the story put it to good use. But I'm sure just by me saying that, you can deduce that it does not. Johnny's main personality trait seems to be confusion, which means his reactions in cutscenes range from wait a minute to huh? Or what's going on? Johnny is the conduit through which the game explains things to the player. Johnny is confused and asks questions because we, the player, need to learn things. He does have some moments of reflection here and there, especially once it's revealed that the evil lady who goes around murdering people is actually his late sister. But those moments are few and far between, and even then they're often downplayed or we move on too quickly for it to matter, which is a shame. Our second protagonist is Shania. Shania is a stereotype. I don't have to tell you what kind. She comes equipped with a henchman named Nathan, who is the same stereotype except male, and his only personality trait is that he's there. And sometimes he forgets how English works, lest we forget that he's a stereotype. Hey. 
Wait, 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 what? What are you? Are you okay? How did you do that? Long time no use. So gate was warped. Also, his special weapon skill is called Gun Fu. Shania and Nathan are the only survivors of their tribe after Malice Grace came over and killed everyone because there's a really cool fusion hiding in their village and her instincts were telling her to kill it, except when she couldn't find it, she just gave up. Very compelling writing, I know. The point was to give Shania a tragic backstory so she could display angst, which she does in spades. She's upset almost as often as she takes her clothes off. We don't have Yuri around this time, so Shania is the fusion character, but she isn't a harmonixer. No, she makes pacts with various spirits, so they lend her their aid. When she defeats one and they join her, she gets a new tattoo and takes off her clothes to turn into her new fusion. And of course her new fusion is also very sexy because she's a woman, so she can't have over-the-top weird-looking monster fusions. Only have boob and butt. Also, she's a princess. She's the princess of her tribe, but also loosely a priestess? And she's engaged to some guy who is a glorified item dispenser? Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. And really, none of that ever comes into play anyway, so who cares, I guess? As an individual, Shania takes on the role of let's get things moving now, everyone. The person who tells everyone to stop dawdling because we have a main quest. She's initially, while focused, still kind and compassionate, as far as we can tell from her interactions, and from her story, you might have gleaned that there's room for development here. She's on a revenge quest to kill Grace, and there's growth potential in revenge storylines. Except her character doesn't really develop, because halfway through the story, Grace gives her the malice kiss, and she just becomes rash and abrasive, focused on her goal to the detriment of all else, because malice magic happened. The goal is always to kill that woman, and it certainly becomes a little one note by the end. We learn very little else about Shania's personality outside of the revenge plot, which is a shame, because stereotypes aside, it's a good setup. Then, because of the malice, we're stuck with nothing but I've got to get to that woman quotes that serve purely to get her into trouble, so everyone else has to come and save her. Yes, her abrasiveness turns her into a damsel in distress. Somehow. Oh man, we can't get there fast enough. I'm going alone. Wait, no, hold up. No. Stop that. What? Every time you do this, you run off on your own and all that happens is you get knocked out again and we have to come and save you again. I don't care. I've got to get to that woman. Shania, you're not being a team player here. It's my revenge plot, Johnny. I don't believe you. If I don't kiss that woman soon, I'll regret it. What? Kill. I mean, I, I, I meant kill. <clears throat> I have got to get to that woman. <laughs> The rest of our party is absolutely whack and simultaneously really boring because they're literally background noise except for a single character. There's Frank Goldfinger, a guy whose job it is to say really dumb things, wear an outrageous outfit, and he also takes on Joachim's pick up any weapon I find gig we saw in Covenant. He's a spy ninja slapstick character. We also get a talking cat called Mao, who works for Al Capone sometimes and used to train with Frank. She's drunk all the time because of her fighting style, and I feel like they were aiming for an Ursula-type voice, but it generally comes off bored more than anything. So, someone's been asking about me, hmm? It wouldn't be the McManus family, would it? When they said it was a student, I was curious. That's very interesting. You're... a cat! Next, there's Hildegard Valentine of the Valentine Vampire family, and she has various forms. Her bat form, where she's a bat, her curvy form, where she's a child who gets weirdly ogled a lot, and her slim form, where she is a dominatrix. No, I mean that. One of her combat quotes is, pretty girls have thorns. I'll tie you up nice and tight. And then she takes out her thorn whip. She also straight up dominates a guy on the street who simply asks for it. It's part of her side quest. It's weird. All of these characters are comedic relief. Every single one of them. Which is unfortunate because, again, there's potential here. They're weird and interesting characters when you meet them. 
and then when they've gone through their recruitment storyline, we just don't really get anything from them. Even if you do their side quests, we don't actually learn anything from them. Nathan, the stereotype, goes hunting for some see-through monsters. Frank goes off to become a better ninja, where we learn that his master keeps killing all his students so he can remain the master, and somehow that doesn't shake him whatsoever, because he's silly and dumb and doesn't notice. Mao stars in her own movie, which just means we do a few solo fights and collect specific items in a rather obnoxious manner otherwise. And Hilda has a similar questline to Joachim, except she has to fight through a weird sushi restaurant so she can eventually fight Joachim. By the end of this story, they're all the same character they started out as. Except for Ricardo, our final party member. I'd like to talk about Ricardo a little longer because He's my favorite character in the game, and I did say I wanted to highlight the good parts too. Ricardo Gomez is a mariachi player who falls in love with Al Capone's sister, Edna. During the story, Edna tragically loses her life, and Ricardo struggles to come to terms with any of it. Initially, he strikes out on his own to kill the man who murdered her, only to realize that Grace saved her life through malice, which just means she turns into a monster eventually forcing us, including Ricardo, to kill her. Of course, blaming Grace, he joins our party to now kill her too. During his side quest, he's told about a mysterious medium that has the power to summon the spirits of the dead into dolls for one night only, so their loved ones can say their goodbyes. Ricardo, wanting to speak to Edna one last time, leaves to investigate, only to find out that one such summoned spirit had refused to leave at all. Instead, she and the lover who had requested her presence in the first place stuffed the medium spirit in a doll herself and then murdered her physical body. We eventually managed to defeat the evil spirit and although we could not save the medium, she allows Ricardo and Edna one night together as her final farewell. It's a very sweet scene and really feels like an ending for Ricardo, finally accepting that Edna is gone and moving on. During the smaller quests leading up to this side quest, we also learn a little more about Ricardo as we go around trying to help people we meet get some closure of their own by finding diaries or delivering letters. And after the game ends, we're told that Ricardo visited Edna's grave one last time and then disappeared altogether. Even though he's absolutely still dressed as a stereotype, he feels like the only real character around. He doesn't constantly make funny faces, or interrupt the conversation by yelling or joking. His story feels like a Shadow Hearts story, and I enjoyed following it very much. It also helps that the Tollhouse music was the only properly creepy music in the entirety of the game. That's our protagonist party, but there are two more antagonists to introduce. Yes, there's three this time, but unlike Covenant, they all mostly stick together and have the same goal, so it doesn't become weirdly disjointed. The first is... Well, I'll, I'll let him introduce himself. People call me killer. <laughs> also, when he eventually meets Grace, he doesn't know her name is Grace, of course. So... Huh. Lady. That's what I'll call you. She is a lady, I suppose, so yeah, naming conventions are accurate? We'll be calling her Lady from this point on. Lady and Killer meet because Killer had done some serial killer things and the police had finally mortally wounded him. Except then Lady shows up, kills all the cops, and kisses him back to good health. So now they're best friends and he is absolutely smitten with her. Beyond this, we don't get any characterization, really. Lady likes to be quiet, walk places, kill and kiss people back to life, Killer likes to loudly talk about how he'll kill people, follow Lady, and then kill people as they go. The third antagonist is Gilbert. He's actually the person who initially drags Johnny into the story at all, and he mostly just does this a lot. 
<laughs> he serves as the person who explains things. Lady and Killer don't know what's going on, but Gilbert does, and so whenever they need to be informed of where the plot's going, Gilbert provides. So yes, he also just follows them around all game. So those are all the characters that generally matter. Let's get into the story. Our story begins with Johnny being approached by definitely not the penguin Gilbert because he wants us to find Marlow. Yes, the guy who helped do the resurrecting. Johnny, desperate for a case, happily accepts and eventually finds Marlow in an abandoned theater, only for a portal to appear which spawns a monster that eats Marlow. At this point, Shania drops through the skylight in her fusion form and as we ogle her buttocks, she beats the monster and drags us back to our apartment after we inevitably faint. But not before we glow red, informing Shania that we're a bit malicey. and once we wake up, she explains a few things. Sometimes, the malice opens a window allowing beasts to come in. The window? Didn't you see the window? It looked like a giant sea green whirlwind. That's why we call that a window. Yeah, I don't see it. Unfortunately, diligent as we are, we have to interrupt all this to tell Gilbert his man got shredded and for some reason Shania and Nathan come along to help us explain. After staring at Shania's melons a while, Johnny accepts, so we travel to Arkham University. Yes, really. It also introduces a Lovecraft side quest character at one point, it's not subtle, it never is. As per Arkham Protocol, we can only enter Gilbert's office through the monster-infested underground tunnels. We do so. Frank is also there, so we decide to pick him up. Whoa, somebody's coming! Oh no! Uh, I've got to hide! Uh. Wow! You killed them! And so fast! Fantastic! What are you talking about? Are you alright? No problem! Frank simply hid using the art of hiding. Frank swore he would use these arts to protect the freedom of the states! Ta -da! Frank learned Professor Gilbert was working on some questionable research. So old Frank decided to come here alone to investigate. No, I have no idea what his accent is supposed to be. Do let me know in the comments if you have any hints. Anyway, let me recap the next part of the story in short form because it's simpler, somehow? Wow, my knife is a lightsaber now, somehow. Where's Gilbert? I don't know, let me send a pigeon to my master to ask. It will take three weeks. Let's go to the Grand Canyon. Okay. A few moments later. I forgot to ask, why did we go here? Shut up, this is my betrothed, Zonda. Zonda, give me access to the sacred altar of the Earth Spirit. Okay. I am naked again and have a new tattoo. My master is in Chicago! A few moments later. Great! After a misunderstanding where you thought we were evil, you now don't think we are. And also, you're a talking cat and only I, Johnny, find that strange. No one else. Help me break Al Capone out of Alcatraz and I'll help you find Gilbert. Meow. No! Oh, yes! I'm Edna! Come down and watch your future party member play guitar! What? Oh no! I'm getting kidnapped by a rival gang boss who is in love with me! Is that a gun? A few moments later... The dying lady. I should kiss her. Well, I'm evil now! Time to go to Alcatraz and free my brother! We break into Alcatraz strangely easily and find Al Capone in the first door to the left just in time to stop a hitman sent by the rival gang boss, McManus. You can tell he's evil because he's tired. Edna also arrives to find Al Capone and so did monsters because malice. Edna should have just taken the first door to the left, but what do I know? We're forced to attack Edna to put a stop to this, but once her big monster is defeated, she has disappeared. No time to think though, we leave for Roswell because Gilbert used to work there. Unsurprisingly, this is where we first meet Roger Bacon and also Hilda, 
both of which are prisoners in Roswell because everyone thinks they're aliens. We break them out, again, very easily, and find out that Gilbert doesn't even work here anymore. He ran off to Chichen Itza. Roger stays behind to fix the ship as we try to follow Gilbert, which really means we're immediately captured by pirates. As characters, the pirates are extremely pointless. They copy the torture scene from Covenant, except it makes way less sense in this scenario. And really, we're just on this island because, you guessed it, there's a water fusion here. So we break out quickly, find the altar, and make friends with the pirates eventually, because... Wow, those guys are really cool. I guess? And no, we do not go straight to Chichen Itza at last. We're told that Al Capone went to Las Vegas because of something Edna related. So we just have to come along because we're very worried about Edna. In Las Vegas, we storm the hotel, alone, to find Ricardo, who also came here for Edna, and then we find McManus, together, while Lady and Killer watch from afar to keep an eye on Edna, presumably. So yes, there are monsters again. And the scene where we find McManus just... Man. We've got you now! Haha, <laughs> but no. I, McManus, will be okay. I have men with guns. Hold it right there. Capone! I also have men with guns. Ha! Yes, but actually no. I win. You do? Ah, shucks. I, I guess if you say so, throw the guns away, lads. I am here! Wait, why did you explode? Well, I am a bombshell. Actually, shoot me. No, I'm serious. The place explodes and then Edna's there, who turns into a monster because malice magic? We end up killing her and then killing McManus, and by then, Lady and Killer got bored, so they left for Chichen Itza. They bump into Gilbert once there, who introduces himself like any self-respecting freelancer would. The name happens to be Gilbert. And I'm a... a I do a lot of different things. Right now I'm unemployed. He manages to join this little party by convincing Killer that he can make Lady human again. Whatever that means. Our own gang is still busy staring at Edna's inexplicably shiny corpse. Capone sheds some manly tears, and we're finally off to Chichen Itza as well. For some reason, we still think Gilbert will be there after all this faffing about, and through the power of plot, I guess he is. Something even Johnny has to comment on. Time waits for no man, but it'll wait a little for a JRPG protagonist. Inside Chichen Itza, Lady has activated Malice Beam number one, and we absolutely break our backs trying to kill the monster Team Evil summoned to stop us. We're so tired, in fact, that Shania triggers Lady's I see a dying lady, I kiss a dying lady reflex, and now Shania becomes angry Shania because she knows she's living on borrowed time. And at this point, I, I'm sorry. Here's another short form because it's so dumb. Dear Diary, isn't it weird that after we nearly got killed, we crawled out of Chichen Itza anyway? All the way to Al Capone's summer house where, conveniently, a detective was complaining about how Killer crossed into South America? Anyway, Capone let us fly his plane to Rio de Janeiro and Shania is sad. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Love you, bye! You think I'm kidding, but we literally just get a voiceover telling us all that. Anyway, we find a clue here that leads to Machu Picchu, where we get to completely fail at stopping Team Rocket once again. But it's okay, because a little girl finds us and convinces us to go visit her grandma, Okanagan, in her little village. In said little village, where all the women say, Wow, hope my husband slash son slash brother slash father comes back soon. It'd be tragic if he didn't. We hear that all the men left to defend the ancient ruin of Vilcabamba from Lady and Killer, which, yes, means means they are all extremely dead. Vilcabamba holds the final malice beam, so it's imperative that we stop Lady. The world will literally end if we don't, so she asks us for help, and that conversation goes something like this. Please, go to Vilcabamba. Stop Lady from opening the final beam. Absolutely not. We're far too busy. But... Anyway, could you tell us where Vilcabamba is? I'm going to kill Lady and stop her from opening the final beam. No! Why did you think I asked you to come here in the first place? I can see I'm wasting my breath. Fine. Here's the map to Vilcabamba. I really wish that was hyperbole. We make our way to Vilcabamba where, for some reason, Lady and the gang is alerted to our presence because Vilcabamba has a CCTV security system, I guess? So an image of us entering the ruins pops up in front of Team Evil. Do we succeed in stopping them? No. Does Team Evil escape into the Malice Gate uninterrupted? Yes. 
do we somehow still make it out of the depths? Yes? Anyway, it's okay, because the Malice Gate won't fully open. Okanagan tells us that's because an extremely salty tower exists that holds the blue light of will. And if we can just go to said salty tower to release that blue light, then the Malice Gate will disappear entirely. This is a lie, by the way, because that never happens. She takes a moment to tell Shania that revenge is bad, and then we're off again to collect two rings. One ring from item dispenser Zonda, who has the audacity to call Shania his beloved, while in the same breath noting that he doesn't care if the world ends. Shut up, Zonda. Vending machines don't talk. And one from a cave. Then we're off to the salty tower, but oh no, Gilbert told Killer what we're doing, so he's going to try and stop us. Which he does because we're agonizingly slow at everything we do. And this culminates in Johnny getting stabbed in the heart, which somehow releases his malice? So he turns into a male version of Lady? Lad? This is Johnny's Awakener form, which he has because... Dude, I don't know. What the hell? He's 21 in this form, so the Shania Johnny dynamic is less creepy? No, it's still creepy. Anyway, it happens because Malice did it? Lad beats everyone unconscious until Shania unleashes the tower's blue light, which does not close the gate, but it does close Johnny, who now has a vivid dream about what really happened in his past. Because Malice. So of course when he wakes up in his own bed, he tells Lenny he wants to go back to his ancestral home to find that... Sorry, what's that? You want to know how Johnny woke up in his own bed? <sighs> Apparently Lenny went into the Salty Tower, which is crawling with high-level monsters, by the way, and personally dragged the whole team out all the way back to Manhattan. The Salty Tower is in Bolivia, by the way. Yeah, I guess Lenny just sensed that we needed rescuing and went through an absolutely titanic amount of trouble to drag us home before Johnny ever woke up. Please stop asking questions, I'm so tired. We investigate the Garland home and get some backstory revealed, which we absolutely need to confirm with Roger Bacon, who confirms it after some shenanigans and offers us a ride to the Malice Gate so we can punch Lady. If we want to, no pressure. Shania and Johnny have a heart-to-heart -heart where Shania reveals that she's got Malice now, and Johnny says, that's okay, but does she want to join his detective agency later though? True love. So we grab Roger's ship and witness Killer give a heartfelt I love you speech to Lady, which is entirely undeserved, and then we kill him, making Lady so mad she cries open the Malice Gate while finally saying Killer's name. They saunter inside, and we follow closely so we can finally kill Gilbert, whose entire plan was to make everyone look like monsters because... because. It's weirdly specific. Anyway, he dies, and we finally find Lady and Killer. Lady is desperately trying to kiss Killer back to life to no avail. Her malice is used up, so instead she tries to kill us alongside her new malice monster. When she loses, she starts to dissolve alongside the last of the red light. She crawls back to Killer, and they float into the sky together. When she says his name again, he wakes up somehow, and they smile at each other before disappearing entirely. Exploding into what seemed to be will particles, perhaps implying that, in the end, Grace got her personality back and somehow still went with the serial killer. The gate is falling apart by now, and Shania has a moment where she considers staying behind now that she got her revenge and her life is devoid of meaning. But Johnny drags her out regardless and the gate fully dissolves. After the credits, we get some end slides for the characters. Nathan went back to the Grand Canyon, Frank to his ninja village, Mao's a Hollywood star, Hilda went back to sleep, Ricardo disappeared, and Johnny is back at his detective agency, still looking for missing cats. Shania, however, can have one of two endings. The good ending sees her at the agency with Johnny, running the place together. Zonda who? Betrothed what? I don't know him! In the bad ending, she's been overtaken by Malice and has taken on a standing menacingly on top of buildings type of lifestyle. John, explain the ending to me and why it is the way it is. Malice. Now, 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 hold, now hold, on, hold on, hold on. And that's the story of Shadow Hearts from the New World. I don't think I need to tell you that I'm not a big fan of the game, but as said, that does not make this a bad game. And I'd like to take this moment first to talk about some development details 
to give you a bit of perspective on why things are the way they are. The From the New World team did not have a great deal of time to work with. About a year or so, in fact. It was an extremely tight schedule. By March 2005, the game was only 60% complete. It released on the 28th of July, two months later. Imagine cramming 40% of a game into two months of development. They also managed to squish it into a single disc, which caused some data storage issues on top of that. And there's a good chance that they didn't even start out with this story to begin with. In a Geek Gamer interview, Matsuzo Machida, one of the creators of Shadow Hearts, said, Shadow Hearts 3 doesn't exist yet, but I don't think that the bad ending of part 2 is the real conclusion. I can't tell you exactly what inspired that, but I'm sure that Yuri, after seeing the destiny of part 2, will lead Shadow Hearts 1 towards a good ending, proving that the actual conclusion of part 2 is a positive one. I'm sure about that. He wanted to continue Shadow Hearts properly. From the New World takes place in the same universe, but it isn't at all linked to previous games, really. Part 3 was supposed to center around Jinpachiro Ben Hiyuga, Yuri's dad, and Kiheita Inugami, Kurando's dad. But that game was never made. Art for the lead characters already existed though, and Miyako Kato even shared some artwork of one of the other companions on his Twitter, the human form of a black bat we meet during Hilda's side quest in From the New World, the Valentine Vampire Grandfather. Perhaps they thought they'd make another game after From the New World, of course, that's entirely possible, but I wouldn't be surprised if the story wasn't quite as set in stone as they'd like from the get-go, especially with the company in chaos. By the time Covenant started development, Sacknoth had already reformed as Nautilus under Aruz. Remember Aruz? No, I suppose not. They didn't really do anything big in the gaming sphere. But Sacknoth had largely thrown in its lot with the Neo Geo Pocket by SNK. No, I don't suppose that'll ring a bell either, because again, it really didn't make any waves. As with most obscure companies, SNK ran into financial trouble and was bought out by Aruz making them the publisher for Shadow Hearts and eventually Covenant. But Aruz isn't really big on game development. They're a lot more focused on... Well... Pachinko. For those unfamiliar with the concept, it's basically funny gambling with a lot of balls, and it's wildly popular in Japan. But you can probably guess that the main thing on their mind wasn't to make anything world-breaking, but like most companies, to make something profitable. And what was profitable in JRPG land during the previous years? Well, Final Fantasy X and Kingdom Hearts. Some Dragon Quest, of course. Perhaps Machida wanted a much darker game, a completely different game. But that wasn't what Aruz wanted. They wanted their own Final Fantasy X, their own Kingdom Hearts. So Shania is basically Yuna going on a pilgrimage for new fusions instead of Aeons. Johnny is a strange cross between Titus and Sora, and yes, the game is very light-hearted. The problem is, Final Fantasy X and Kingdom Hearts each had a heart. No pun intended. That from the new world is missing. They knew what story they wanted to tell, and it was heartfelt, gripping, and very sad at times, but with a good dose of humor at the right moments. No matter the situation, in From the New World, the more serious scenes are not allowed a moment to breathe. Someone would be doing something silly in the background, a funny sound interrupted things, or at best, the scene was very short. The goal was, of course, to attract a bigger audience once again, and a lot of design decisions stemmed from that need. It's also why they decided to go with a new cast entirely in the end, giving the old Shadow Hearts characters easter eggs at best, so it would be easier for newcomers to the series to pick up the game and enjoy it. And they really needed something that would finally break the bank. I love the original Shadow Hearts to death, but I have to admit by this point that I'm in the minority. At least I was back then. By the end of their first fiscal year that included Shadow Hearts, it had sold about 110,000 units in Japan. Final Fantasy X? had sold 2.26 million. And yes, Final Fantasy is an established game series made by a company that no doubt has a much bigger advertising budget as well, but all of that taken into account and given how much time and money it costs to create a game, it's a massive gap and I understand fully why Aruz would seek to increase that share. Covenant ended up selling more than double the amount of the first game and while I'm sure a good part of the sales were driven by the first game's memories, it also reviewed a lot better. The further we moved away from Kudelka, 
the more light-hearted the games became, because that seemed to be drawing in the crowds. But that changed with From the New World. It sold about 82,000 units in Japan, so no, I'm not at all surprised that this entry was the final nail in the coffin. But neither am I surprised that this is the route they took. The team was trying so hard to use feedback to create a game their fans would love, that in the end they lost sight of what made Shadow Hearts, Shadow Hearts. Of all the things it should never have been, it became a generic RPG. Although, mind you, not for a moment do I believe that the developers, the programmers, everyone who worked on this game didn't care. Of course they cared. But when you're pulled in so many directions at once, how can you be expected to focus on your work properly? From the New World wanted to be every popular game on top of being a Shadow Hearts game. And that's simply not a combination that worked out. In trying to do so, details were left by the wayside. They dropped plot lines, there are comments that go nowhere, and copied character traits. The side quests that, bar Ricardo's, go nowhere and explore nothing. It felt like the team making the game wasn't really given much direction save make it make money. We've got to have money. And Aruz wasn't even done pulling their developers apart. No, no. Aruz pulled an EA. Initially, they only bought out SNK so they could use their popular characters in pachinko machines. Konami, eat your heart out. They never really intended to properly back SNK's gaming division. In fact, it started to sneakily liquidate SNK's assets while cutting production's costs. They intended to let the whole thing implode once they'd sold off all they could, and this was all going down in 2001. Plenty of people from the original company were already jumping ship by this point, and SNK filed for bankruptcy pretty soon after, putting its assets up for sale. Can you imagine being an employee under these circumstances? For veterans in the video game history field, you've probably already realized that this legal mess absolutely means that making a new Shadow Hearts game at this point is near impossible. As far as is known, UEC still holds the Shadow Hearts license at this point in time, and I don't need to tell you that they don't sound like the preserve creativity type of company. Even if the whole team wanted so terribly badly to make the best game they could, they would never be allowed to do so. A strict deadline, vague directions, and the prospect of losing your job looming over you while your colleagues are slowly jumping ship already? This game was never going to be perfect. But I still think, despite it all, it did some things well. So let's talk about that too. Firstly, I hesitate to call this game a Shadow Hearts game. It moved away from its original intentions by such a margin that it's hardly comparable, and if you're going to look at this game as purely a Shadow Hearts game, you have no choice but to be disappointed. I fully expect that they used the name purely because it held brand recognition and nothing else. So in that respect, I think this game works absolutely fine as a JRPG. The environments and characters are colorful and expressive, there's a solid dose of humor of course, and one thing you can at least say about the main story is that you'll never be bored. Secondly, the voice acting has absolutely improved. It isn't perfect, no, but there were far fewer moments that took me out of the game entirely, and the subtitles actually match what's being said too, which was a bothersome problem in Covenant. I also have to mention the monster designs again. There's a giant baby head, as usual of course, but overall I think the monsters have always been the one thing that remained faithful to Kudelka, and after it, Shadow Hearts. They didn't compromise their aesthetic. Some of them are proper nightmare material, and I can imagine they had a lot of fun on the design team there. And of course the standard Shadow Hearts favorites are here. The Judgment Ring, the NPCs on the streets having extremely descriptive names, side quests for every character. Said side quests are debatable in quality of course, but they are, if nothing else, interesting side activities. The CGI cutscenes have also vastly improved, and most of them, especially regarding the lighting, took a lot of care to look properly cinematic. I unfortunately have to say that these are also the only direct compliments I have. The music, something I praised in every previous Shadow Hearts game, and I do include Kudelka here, was lackluster this time around. It should be noted that Yasunoro Mitsuda, from the Chrono Games, left the music department for this entry and his presence definitely is sorely missed. Now, let's talk about some of the strange, unexplained parts in the story. Well, some mystery wouldn't be out of place, at least. Drop plot threats randomly! I said mystery, not- Mention important character traits and then never mention them again! See, this is why- LET CHARACTERS TELEPORT! Okay, here we go again. Ah! 
For stories such as these, no, you don't need to explain everything. It's a fantasy world. You have some leeway there, but in this game, there's a lot. Let's go over a few of them. Why did a monster portal appear when we met Marlo? He didn't receive a malice kiss, Johnny has never opened portals before, or since, and Shania certainly wouldn't have, so why did it suddenly show up? If it's because he was present during a successful resurrection, wouldn't this have affected Roger too? Is it because he suddenly got very scared after seeing Johnny, who is supposed to be dead? If it is, why aren't other scared people creating portals too? What I'm trying to say is, this likely just happens so Shania can meet Johnny and no other reason. That's not a very good reason. Why is Johnny's knife a lightsaber now? That never happened before, and he's had that knife for a while now. Is it because he came in contact with a portal? But that happened before, so why only now? And for that matter, why did Johnny travel three weeks away to the Grand Canyon and only then ask why they were doing so? Why is no one bothered that Shania decides to stay with Johnny instead of her betrothed by the end? Why did Edna disappear at Alcatraz? She saw Al Capone, the man she was looking for, but somehow she just went up in smoke. Why did we have to go to Las Vegas to help Capone? Because we were all worried about Edna? Really? I thought our goal was to find Lady and kill her. Isn't that what Shania's entire life has been about? Why is Lenny so insistent? that Johnny stop messing around so he can take over his father's company? What company? It seems to be doing fine without Johnny. Lenny also asks him to finally go home? What home? The Garland home is in ruins. Johnny is also 16. How would he run a company at all? What are you talking about, Lenny? Why was Edna a literal bomb? Or otherwise phrased, why did the top floor of the hotel blow up? Is this malice magic again? Why does Lady never blow things up? It seems extremely convenient and would solve some of her problems rather well. Why do other people turn into monsters because of malice, but not the main malice recipients? Wouldn't they be far more prone to do so? And for that matter, why does Shania not turn into a monster in the good ending? Is it love? Is it willpower? If it's that, why couldn't Edna do the same? She was deeply in love with Ricardo and we already saw her stand her ground in the face of death. Are you telling me she didn't have any willpower? Someone took a picture of Lady and Killer at Machu Picchu, which someone then sent to the newspaper, who then decided it was relevant enough to post, only for us to find an old newspaper with said picture, which leads us to Machu Picchu and the evil gang. You're telling me that between someone taking that picture, the paper printing that article, us finding that article, and subsequently traveling to Machu Picchu, Lady and Killer didn't quite complete their errands? It takes about two and a half days to drive from Rio de Janeiro to Machu Picchu, or about 16 hours of flight. There's more, I just feel that probably gets my point across. Things in this game don't happen because there is any sort of logic behind it, they happen because the plot demands it. Most times it'll be explained away by pointing towards malice and no, we don't know everything there is to know about malice. There's absolutely allowed to be some mystery surrounding it. But when it's every event, it becomes less mysterious and more a wizard did it. It becomes very difficult to keep myself invested in the story when at any moment, I know literally anything could happen because malice exists and it's their catch-all for plot progression. Shania doesn't get character progression, she gets the kiss of malice and now she's angry all the time, that's it. Then once the ending rolls around, she's either back to her original self or still angry except now she's also Batman. Which brings me to my next topic, the characters. Again? Much like the plot, the characters don't often need any rhyme or reason to do what they do. Literally, Hilda just joins us because she wants to? She has no real reason to join us, but from their point of joining, none of them really progress at all. And most of the time, we only really know how they're feeling because they strictly tell us how they're feeling, rather than show us through their actions. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel! That makes me feel angry! Johnny starts out a confused boy with a detective agency where he's asked to rescue cats all the time. He's a little resentful of that, he wants a real job. Then he goes on a quest and in the end, he's quite literally back where he started except now he knows he's a malice lad. He's still rescuing cats, he's still making a fuss about that, except now he might have a hot girlfriend who still dresses the exact same and is five years older than the literal 16 year old child running this agency. Shania starts out as a nice woman who wants revenge. She gets a little angry in the middle and then by the end she's either still very angry or a nice woman who's dating a 16 year old child. Nathan is a guy and by the end he is still a guy. Frank is a weird ninja role player when we meet him and by the end he still is but now he's on TV sometimes. Mao is a weird talking cat. Hilda is a weird talking bat. Ricardo is the only person who gets anything and I mean anything at all. The problem here, largely, is that this installment of Shadow Hearts is not character-driven. It's extremely plot-driven. 
In Kudelka, we eventually had to stop Elaine from doing what she was doing, sure, but every step we take throughout the game, we learn more about our three main characters. Why they're there, what drives them, why that drives them, their backstory, their relationship with the other two people. And by the end, all of that has been turned on its head. In Shadow Hearts, we're in Yuri's shoes, stuck mulling over our guilt while slowly opening up to Alice, this girl who is herself trying to process her father's death while falling in love with Yuri. And all of its side characters are integrated within the main story, not just their recruitment quest. In Covenant, we see the culmination of Yuri's story. It's quite literally just a story about Yuri and how his character is changing. The rest, the saving the world stuff, it's always just a backdrop. In From the New World, that backdrop moves itself to the forefront. We aren't really getting the story of Johnny's amnesia and how he deals with the revelations. We get a few snippets of Johnny being a little sad about having to kill his sister, but that's it. We're not getting any real breaks between dragging ourselves from one location to the next on the hunt for lady and killer. It feels like a literal race, and in the meantime, while we learn about the events surrounding our characters, we don't learn anything about how our characters feel about said events. And there's a chance that this sort of character development was simply dropped, probably due to time pressure. Several times throughout the game, people will comment on how Shania is taking on a great burden every time she collects a new fusion. This is it. Ah, uh, Shania? You needn't look so worried. That all these spirits within her are taking a toll on her, but that's never expanded upon. It's dropped like a hot potato, and I feel like it was trying to move towards a Yuri-type conflict. Perhaps the spirits would eventually cause Shania to lose herself entirely, unsure what parts of her personality were hers and which were purely influenced by the spirits inside of her. Or perhaps we would eventually have to make a choice. Do we let Shania take on another spirit, but risk her actual death? Her final fusion, the one that is required for the good ending, is the Spirit of the Sun. Before fighting it, we're warned that if we lose, Shania will be burned to a crisp. What if taking on this fusion would be a ticking time bomb? It would give us the power to defeat Lady, but Shania would quickly burn from inside. Something that could be prevented by Shania finally finding it within herself to let go of her revenge and simply seek to save the world for its own sake. Whereas the bad ending would see her pull through solely for revenge. On the other hand, we could have also used her storyline to simply address her thirst for revenge. On a few occasions, Shania is reprimanded for her bloodlust, and it certainly opens up the possibility for a later questline, during which she can no longer run away from those feelings. When we eventually learn that Lady is simply the empty husk of grace, Shania could learn to temper her emotions, learn to find peace with the fact that both Grace and her have known tragedy and still know some form of empathy for this girl who gave her own life for her brothers, turning into a monster in the process. There are so many ways they could have gone with this, and I haven't even touched on Lady and Killer yet. They get nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. Lady walks, Killer follows, scowls a bit, and then he confesses his undying love to her before dying immediately. And Lady loves him back. Somehow. I could see how perhaps Killer became infatuated with her entirely, causing a toxic sort of love to sprout after she saved his life. But Lady? Did she fall in love with him because he kept stalking her everywhere? When by the end they seemingly ascend to heaven, their shared smile is incredibly unearned. There never was an interesting relationship here, just two plot devices who were told to say cheese. And again, I'm slapped in the face by the unfulfilled potential here. I mentioned that the will particles in the final scene might imply that Grace regained her humanity in the end. Wouldn't it have been grand if we could have seen her slowly bond with Killer, slowly regaining her humanity? Something Gilbert lied about to kill her in the first place. Something Killer desperately wanted. And then, by the end, in death, she was finally whole again. As it stands, we saw two serial killers we knew next to nothing about finally find happiness. What am I supposed to do with that information? It's frustrating because this game almost has something but never goes the distance, which brings me finally to the conclusion.
me take this final moment to point out a few more things that I simply observed while playing this game. Just things that I thought might be amusing or sometimes disturbing, really. Gerard, the gay vendor from last time, is back and he's a more offensive stereotype than ever. He also has a boyfriend now who is equally terrible representation. This student who is in love with her teacher? No. No? Very bad. Very bad. Very bad. This poor soul describing the actual education system in too many countries. This guy preparing to take over the world. These roommates. They're roommates. They're roommates. They're roommates. They're roommates. They're roommates. roommates. They're roommates. And they were roommates. Oh my god, they were roommates. This scene existing? Wait, is it me? Am I a weirdo? As a side note, there is also an NG plus mode, but I cannot recommend it. A few things carry over, mainly your spells and the items you slot them into, as well as your snapshots. That's Johnny's side quest. He takes pictures of every single monster and sometimes he needs to take multiple pictures of the same monster so you can trade it to another card collector for even more cards for your collection. This is how I ended up sitting around to take eight separate snapshots of an Olympic medalist cat. And yes, to find every monster, you have to do every single side quest. And there are missable monsters, so you better make sure Johnny is in all your battles. What do you get for doing all that once you're in NG+, you ask? You get a single eternal key. Don't be fooled by the name. You can use this key a single time on a single monster. It's a very good item, but I wanted to punch my screen after having gone through this much trouble, only to realize the item is single use. This game has a great deal of imperfections, and they absolutely show. It certainly does not feel like a worthy Shadowheart successor. I've been calling it from the new world throughout the majority of this video because it isn't really Shadow Hearts. It's something that takes elements from Shadow Hearts, but lacks the soul and personal stories the series has always tried to incorporate. Does that make it a bad game? No, but it does make it a bad story. I generally feel bad coming to that conclusion. I much prefer to find the stories I enjoy so I can talk about those, which is why I initially started this Shadow Hearts series. I just wanted to make a video on Kudelka and Shadow Hearts, but I suppose I had to finish what I started. And this game's story was a letdown, to say the least. But hey, Ricardo's story was a highlight, so we have that. Perhaps one day UEC will dig the Shadow Hearts IP out of the bin again to give it another go. After all, horror is getting a little bit more attention these days, so they might even want to license it out to someone who cares to give the developers the time and backing it takes to make something we can all get behind. I mostly feel terrible for the people who worked on this game, put their heart and soul into it under all that pressure, only for it to flop like this. They deserve better, and I hope they're well. And on that somewhat dour note, I hope you still enjoyed this video. If you made it this far, then thank you very much for watching. If you were thinking of commenting, incorporate the word werewolf or werewolves in there somewhere, so I know you're in the know. And if you enjoy my content, consider supporting me on Patreon or, preferably, Ko-fi. Thank you as always to my wonderful patrons and Ko-fi cats, and until another tale finds us. I apologize for the sheer amount of time that's passed between my last video and this one. I know you said to upload on a when it's done, it's done basis, but I still would like to keep the uploads somewhat consistent. Although having said that, I'd like to try and learn a new editing program. At the moment I'm using Adobe After Effects, as I always have, and it's certainly uh, less than stable. I tried Vegas as well, and sadly it had a slew of technical problems, even though I paid for it for a change. I mean, as I always do, of course. So if you have any recommendations, do let me know. I feel like even though it'll take some time to get used to a new program after all this time, it'll speed things up in the long run. We're sticking with the when it's done, it's done format though. I'll just have to learn to live with the guilt of making you wait, because I do think it makes for better videos when I'm not desperately trying to finish a video just to meet a deadline. We're also not going to try and appease the YouTube algorithm anymore. The algorithm can suck spherical objects of indeterminate sizes. We're going to talk about werewolves next time, and it will have a Patreon and Kofi Cat outro again, of course. Va fail. <laughs>